I'm Roger Highfield. I'm the science editor of the Daily Telegraph. Now, words mean everything to me, but now I'm going to have the speech area of my brain turned off with a giant magnet. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together <laughs> again. That may have looked like a strange party trick, but it's actually part of a serious research project conducted by Prof. Vince Walsh in a basement lab at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in London. He's using electrical and magnetic brain stimulation to understand the most complex known object in the universe and how to treat conditions such as migraine and stroke. Just to show the power of the magnetic fields passing through my scalp and that this wasn't a trick, this is what it did to our videotape, even though it was positioned a few meters away. It's hard to see because of the interference, but here I could still sing a nursery rhyme, even when he disabled my language center, because singing depends on the other side of the brain. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses and all the king's men, couldn't put Humpty together again. I felt a bit apprehensive during this intriguing demonstration, but Professor Walsh thinks nothing of tinkering with his own brain for the sake of science. Jack and Jill went up the... Went up the... Ah, oh, that's great. <laughs> As researchers from around the world are about to gather to discuss the latest results, he told me about the remarkable potential of brain stimulation. When we're trying to do um, experiments in which we establish how people might recover from uh, stroke or some other kind of, of, of brain damage, then we can try and make very good it, educated guesses about which processes we want to interfere with to help your weakened but still happening processes take over the, the function that you couldn't, couldn't do anymore. The equipment and the, and the things we can do with it are, are evolving into clinical uses now and we have a number of problems with classical transcranial stimulation with these coils and the, and the big machines and the mapping of the, of the brain that you have to do when you carry out these experiments. What we're trying to think of are ways of getting brain stimulation into the clinic and into the home as well. So with a, with a migraine, someone feels it coming on they put these electrodes on the head and with a bit of luck they can stop the attack before it really develops. So some migraines are, are caused by having um, too much activity in the visual brain area and some are by having too little activity and we hope that this can balance out, reverse that relative inactivity in the brain. So we're looking at, at downsizing the, the ways of, of, of delivering the currents, producing smaller machines and producing electrodes that will pass very, very small currents that you don't make clicks and that you're not aware of in the way that you were aware of, of being magnetically stimulated previously. And these will change the excitability of the brain for uh, longer periods of time. The problem with magnetic stimulation is its effects are pretty immediate. You said th -th 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 for a few milliseconds, but then you passed on to the rest of the nursery rhyme you were fine. With this we can change the way that the brain is able to be sensitive to tasks for tens of minutes up to 90 minutes afterwards. And we think that might be much more valuable in a clinical setting. Jack and